Hey guys and welcome to my channel. In this video, I want to talk about narcissists in the cinema. Okay, so I want to provide some movies that will depict narcissism, okay? And I try to find varieties of movies that would perhaps focus on different angles. So for those of you who would like some visuals and examples of what narcissistic abuse looks like and, you know, certainly toxic, um, disturbing relationships, um, you might want to check out these following movies, all right? And my disclosure is that, you know, if you have experienced narcissistic abuse, some, even all of these movies could possibly be um, a kind of trigger to you because although it is a cinema, you know, they are based off of things that, you know, obviously can happen and have happened in real life. Okay. So I'm just going to say that. So the first movie that I have on my list and this one just dropped into my head very quickly to go on this list for narcissists in cinema is The Color Purple. Okay, the color purple, uh, color purple movie was released in 1982, the movie, and it's based off of a novel written by Alice Walker um, titled The Color Purple. Um, since she has written that novel, yes, it has been made into a film and, and actually a musical as well. So this um, movie takes place in a rural, rural part of um, Georgia in the 1930s, okay? And the characters, the two main characters that, you know, stand out in my head with this movie are basically the two main characters of the movie is someone named Albert, um, who's called Mr. and Seely, Okay. So Albert, you know, he plays um, the narcissist in this video. And every time I watch it, even to this day, um, I don't watch it too frequently for myself because because of the energy around it and my empathic nature. And, you know, the more that I've learned about psychology and narcissistic abuse and, you know, the um, Danny Glover, who played Albert, he just did an amazing job. You know, it's eerie to me, um, how he played this character, but, um, you know, this movie has so many layers, um, to it and so many rich characters in here. I'm just, you know, highlighting Albert and Silly, but there are other characters as well um, with a lot of toxicity in there and, you know, a lot of things that they have to learn and evolve from. But long story short, um, Silly is a, um, is a girl and it starts out with her being abused by her own biological father, you know, who rapes her. She conceives two children by him and he takes the children and gives them up for adoption. Um, her mother passes away in the middle of this and actually curses her on her deathbed. Okay. So, um, you know, this is happening when she is what, 13, 14 years old, you know, having these two children by her father. All right, so this is a trauma in itself, just experiencing that. And, you know, with the dysfunction with her parents, it's like she just, you ever hear someone say, like, they just didn't even have a chance. Like, it just started out with so much toxicity. So moving along, um, Silly's father is approached by Albert because he wants to actually marry Silly's sister, Natty. And Silly's father didn't want to let go of Natty. Natty um, played the role of the golden child in this movie. And this is where I'm talking about these onions um, of layers here where um, a lot of things are actually touched on. So his father um, idealized Natty as the, the pretty beautiful daughter and made 
um, Silly, the scapegoat and his emotional punching bag and the ugly, unattractive daughter. So when Albert approaches him to marry Nettie, he says, no, you can't have Nettie, but you can have Silly. And then he runs it down to Albert. She'll cook for you. She'll clean for you. She may not be much to look at, but she'll do what, she, what you need her to do, the wifely duties. But Natty, you can't have her. You cannot have her. So in his mind, you know, he was getting rid of what he would consider his damaged goods, you know. And, and Albert was a widower with a bunch of children and he just really wanted someone to come and cook and clean and take care of his children, you know, now that he didn't have his wife. So Silly, you know, um, marries him and, you know, goes to his dysfunctional house and, you know, starts that chapter of her life. Okay. But we're talking about decades upon decades of her being abused emotionally, um, psychologically, and physically. And the children were rotten. They had no discipline. They had no structure. Um, you know, she put up with a lot. She put up with a lot. So the whole movie in itself is her evolution of healing from her childhood wounds and actually um, learning how to stand up for herself, learning how to have a voice, learning how to set boundaries and learning self-love, you know, because of all the abuse that she experienced early on in life, you know, she was severely deprived in that state. You know, she used writing as a way to um, release her feelings or at least have a voice. And she would write letters to her sister, Nettie. Um, throughout her life and she would write letters to God as well but you know she had to she eventually realized that she had to move from this state of just writing these letters to God and not actually taking an action other than writing to God because God helps those who help themselves you know, he gives us a free will and sometimes, you know, people are waiting for miraculous things to just fall from the sky, you know, basically. And, um, no, we put the footwork in and I always tell people we do our best and God does the rest. We do our best and God does the rest. So, you know, much later in life, um, she got stronger emotionally when she finally reached her fed up points and through many trials and tribulations and like I said decades upon decades upon decades of abuse you know I want to say half a century no not quite half a century I won't say quite 50 years but she married him really young and by the time that she actually moved away from him you know she was an older woman with gray hairs and like you know she was much older she was near getting near 50. Okay. But, um, it's a very long movie. Um, like I said, lots of onions, lots of rich characters. And, you know, if you've been studying narcissistic abuse, you will see, you know, a lot of things playing out in the family dynamics and a lot as far as the romantic relationship goes. And, you know, unfortunately, Mr. Slash Albert, that character does exist in the world. There are people who have experienced that type of personality and God bless them. You know, the survivors who have come out of those type of situations because he did a number on her. He did a number. Okay. So, um, I'm going to move to the next movie here on my list and that is the white or lender that is based off of a novel as well and this movie came out um, October 11 2002 and um, this one is good as far as um, if you've ever been in foster care and of course it also just like the color purple with Celia and her father this young lady um, named Astrid in the movie pay, played by Allison Lohman um, 
had issues with her mother as well. You know, I say this, or let me just say it definitely again in this video that, you know, narcissists, they shouldn't be parents, you know, they shouldn't be parents, you know, and her mother, um, they describe her in the movie um, synopsis as this free spirited artist, you know, and basically she had a child and produced Astrid with this man and he left her and that devastated her. Um, and now she, here she is as a single mom and she gets into another relationship with another man, Barry, and she ends up murdering him when she finds out that he cheats, cheated on her with a younger woman, you know, that triggered her. Um, I'm assuming back to the abandonment and rejection that she felt when Astrid's father left her and she hated men for this and in a narcissistic rage, she murdered him. She murdered him and she was sentenced to life in jail, which then put her sister, not her sister, her daughter in the system to be taken care of by the state. So the movie takes you on a journey with Astrid going from group home to um, foster homes, things not working out. And this one is full of um, layers as well as you know, these different foster families, you can see the codependency um, on two different levels here. And I found that to be quite interesting, along with the main relationship with her and her mother and how her mother, you know, of course, with Astrid longing to maintain a relationship with her mother, um, she's writing her mother and visiting her mother in jail off and on, telling her all the business and her mother is actually manipulating her to sabotage, um, the foster homes that she was in because she didn't like the people that her daughter was being placed with. And I will say that, you know, chances are, you know, these places weren't the best places for her anyway, but her mother certainly didn't make it better. Okay. Um, one of the foster homes that she ended up with was um, with a former stripper, recovering alcoholic, who was a born-again Christian. But, you know, this woman had a lot of childhood wounds herself that needed to be healed. And she had a relationship, um, she was in a relationship with a guy that eventually um, started an emotional affair with Astrid, you know, so the woman before the affair really took off, she noticed how her boyfriend had took a liking to Astrid and she had several foster children under her roof and, um, her whole, she was very codependent and her whole happiness was centered around how well her relationship with her boyfriend was going. So, um, she wanted to remain youthful. She wanted to always keep his eyes, like his opinions and all of that really mattered. And the other children knew this, the other foster children, and they warned Astrid when they seen him getting close to her. Look, don't ruin. We have a nice thing going here. She's not going to take it very well if she thinks that he likes you more or he's more attracted to you. Like it was ridiculous. But, um, he was more attracted to Astrid and she realized it, which caused her to spiral back into her alcoholism. And, and she, in her narcissistic rage, when the stuff really hit the fan, she ended up shooting Ash, shooting her gun towards Astrid, you know, and shooting her in the shoulders. And that ended that situation and put Astrid into the hospital and then back into the group home pending um, another placement. But, you know, in that whole situation, you know, now that I've learned more about psychology, because I've seen this movie years and years and years ago, um, you know, this woman was so codependent in her relationship with her boyfriend. And it was the only thing that really mattered to her. And it's where she got her self-esteem, is where she got her self-identity, you know. So, um, Astrid, you know, goes to the hospital. She gets well enough to get put back into the group home where she befriends, um, a guy named Paul, you know, who clearly has romantic feelings, you know, teenager love, if you will. 
crush, if you will, and but in a healthy manner. You know, he lets her know that, you know, one day when he turns 18, he's going to go to New York and he wants her to come with him. She turns him down. So um, in between all of that, she's getting placed in another home um, with a character played by Renee Zellweger, um, who is a former actress on basically on Suicide Watch. So, you know, they got her or they wanted to um, take in a foster child to actually be a babysitter to um, Renee Zellweger's character as her marriage is um, crumbling, another codependent here. And, you know, so is her self-esteem and her zest for life at that point. And... Astrid is telling her mother, you know, about this new woman that she's with. And her mother, lo and behold, has been writing Claire, which is Renee Zellweger's character the whole time. And she's, you know, with her emotional intelligence has realized that this woman has a little self-esteem and suicidal. And, you know, I made a video about this, how the narcissist um, pushes us, pushes a person to the edge, you know. Who may already be in a broken state obviously and can push them off the cliff so between these writings you know her mother has found a way to further passive aggressively um, pull Renee Zellweger's character down to a deeper abyss and eventually she actually does succeed in committing suicide Okay, which sends her daughter back to the group home. Back to the group home. So it's questionable, you know, had her mother not been writing Renee and Renee did get that professional help and perhaps turned her attention more on her daughter instead of getting further manipulated, you know, by um, Astrid's mother, maybe she could have come out of this depression. And that's why you have to watch who we keep in our orbit, who we share our energy with, guys. So she ends up back in a group home. At this time, um, I believe her friend is turning 18 and he offers her to come with him and she turns him down. And then she goes and visits all these foster families. And instead of actually choosing a healthy family, she chooses to go with this Russian immigrant woman. Okay. So it's almost like she gave up at this point on trying to have a normal, healthy family existence. And she actually chose the most toxic choice out of all of the foster um, parents that she could have gone with at the time. And she goes to this Russian immigrant who has other foster children that she basically treats like cheap labor. And she runs this... Um, this swap meat business, or she does basically, she does a lot of consignment and um, yard sale type of thing. And you can just see the main character, Astra, as she transforms through all of these experiences from this blonde haired girl to this black gothic look. You know, she's just in embracing the darkness in life. She's like, I feel like at this point, she just feels trapped. Like, you know, I can't get away from this anyway. I'm not even going to try. I surrender, basically. And sometimes that really does happen to people. All right. So she goes with this Russian immigrant. And while she's there in this household, her mother lawyer contacts her because her mother has been trying to get up get out of jail the whole time um, based off of her allegations of domestic violence towards the guy uh, that she experienced from the guy Barry that she ended up killing you know she made a case for this and she wanted her daughter to lie on the stand because her daughter was there um, when the the murder took place and if her daughter would vouch for that that could be like something that could vindicate her basically and lead to her becoming a free woman. Um, the lawyer offered her all types of the daughter Astrid, all types of financial or whatever she wants in order for her to take the stand and tell this lie. Um, the daughter, obviously the daughter does not want to do it. And, um, 
feels very conflicted about it, but you know, she's passively aggressively going along with it. And the Russian immigrant who's all about money says, girl, you better take the money and keep it moving. Don't worry about anything else. And you know, it's not the way Astrid looked at it. Either way, on the date of the court, um, the date that she was supposed to take the stand, um, the mother uh, decides to tell the lawyer to tell her daughter to leave, which means, you know, she was going to try to win the case without this vital piece of information or vital testimony that would have probably gotten her free, which resulted in her being sent back to prison and, you know, losing that case. So um, Astrid felt like it was her mother letting her go. So fast forward, um, she ends up linking back up with the guy in New York and eventually her hair is blonde again and she makes a life with him. So, you know, to me it's symbolic of her actually eventually letting go herself, you know, because although her mother may have let go that day in the courthouse, um, Astrid probably, you know, had some things to do herself. All right. And, you know, it's a pathway. It's a, and it's a process, you know, us healing from abuse and narcissistic abuse in particular. But, um, yeah, that's White Orlander and, um, great movie, great movie. So you can definitely check that out as a reference. The next movie on my list is Mommy Dearest. And that is, you know, based off of um, the childhood of someone called Christina Crawford and who was adopted as well by Joan Crawford. So here's another situation with foster care and not foster care in this case. It's just a flat out adoption. Okay. Um, so this is based off of someone's real life and it stems from Christina um, Crawford's book or autobiographical book that she wrote. Um, this was released on September 18, 1981. So this one is pretty vintage. You can find clips of this on YouTube where you can see the depiction of the abuse. Now I'm going to make some disclosures about this one. Um, I did, you know, I did a fair amount of research on this, um, before I decided to add it on the list. But for the sake of my research, I will say that um, for this particular movie, I can't say that Christina is absolutely telling the truth. You know, um, this movie was released, like I said, in September 18, 1981, which was several years after uh, Joan Crawford's death, which was in, I believe, 77 or, you know, somewhere along those lines. All right. So. You know, she wrote the book and the movie was made after Joan Crawford passed away. So, um, you know, she, in all fairness, um, she did not get to uh, defend herself against this. All right. Um, so for the sake of this movie being an example, I will just stick to the cinema aspect of it. And I'm going to treat it as pure cinema you know, I'm not going to say, you know, Joan Crawford definitely did these things or didn't before someone jumps down in the comments, a uh, Joan Crawford fan or even a Christina Crawford fan. I'm not saying that she's lying either, but I am saying that the movie um, does depict a very abusive, narcissistic mother. And for that reason, I will add it on the list. Okay. As a reference. All right. So, you know, um, a lot of times, you know, basically children end up being the emotional punching bags, you know, of the narcissistic parent. And this is exactly what's happening in the movie. And you get to see a lot of narcissistic rage here, entitlement, and, um, you know, some of the lines that the mother said to the daughter is, you love to make me hit you. You deliberately embarrass me. I don't ask for much. Why can't you just respect me? But all along, you know, the mother is not reciprocating to the daughter and it's one-sided. Like, give me the glory. Give me love. Give me respect while I treat you like my emotional uh, punching bag at that point. All right. Now, in real life, um, Joan Crawford to the end always um, said my loving daughter when she talked about Christina Crawford 
Now, if she is narcissistic, that could point to, um, you know, the image focus because narcissists are very image focused you know, and actually it kind of sways their way in a certain sense, because here you have a possible, you know, survivor here of abuse saying, Hey, I've been abused. And they're telling all these bad things about this other person, but yet the other person only keeps talking about them in good light. It's like, Hey, who's really the bad guy here? It sometimes it plants questions and other people's perceptions when, you know, um, the narcissist, um, keeps putting you in high esteem while you're trying to tell about their abuse. You know, it's a psychological thing that some people whose emotional intelligence, you know, may not be that high. They could fall for that. Okay. But, um, we do know that Joan Crawford did remove Christina Crawford from her will, you know, and it's also known that, uh, Christina Crawford did keep Joan Crawford's last name, all right, even though she's been married over three times. Um, and what else do I have written down here as far as factual stuff? Yeah, so there's a Larry King interview of her well after the fact, and I watched some of that to try to gauge with her. And, you know, I haven't watched all of it. You know, I just don't have that type of time. And I have a lot of material to put out on the channel and the coaching sessions that I do. But, you know, I did want to just kind of like for every movie to do some scrubbing, if you will, meaning going into the background and, you know, finding out little inside things that I could. All right. So, but the comment section is definitely lit under this, under this Larry King interview. People have all types of um, opinions on what was true, what wasn't true. And some of them took Joan Crawford's side and some of them took Christina Crawford's side. But, um, you know, people minimally uh, respect Joan Crawford for her artistic um, um, gifts and, you know, her work that she left behind. All right. But yeah, the movie um, death definitely depicts a um, narcissistic mom and, you know, she even tried to kill her daughter in her narcissistic rage. And, you know, when people are heightened in that emotional state, they can black out, guys. All right. They can certainly, certainly black out. All right. So let's talk about the next movie that I have on here and that's Fatal Attraction. And that was released in September 11, 1987. And that's, um, Michael Douglas and what is this? Glenn Close. Is it just Glenn Close? Sorry if I mispronounce her name, but this one is very good for as far as pointing out like that stalker, that male female stalker scenario. And um, that's certainly what this movie depicts. A married man has a fling with this woman and he thinks, you know, that's just gonna be it. And this woman says, no, I'm not going anywhere. She tries to destroy his marriage. She takes his child. Like she, you know, she becomes a stalker and then some to him. Like he probably, he regrets the day he ever said a word to this woman by the end of this movie okay so um i recently made a movie not a movie a um, upload about when what happens when you block the narcissist so yes when in the romantic relationship and especially you know if you were cheating or having an affair or even just if you try to move on into the next relationship they could do some fatal attraction stuff to you. And it may sound really extreme as it did in this movie, but this happens to people. This really happens to people. They get very delusional about what the relationship really represented. You could have told them, look, this is just a booty call. This is just casual to me. You know, I'm not looking for nothing serious right now. But if in their mind, oh, you took my body, you're my supply, like I claimed you, then, you know, when you try to end things or it's run its course in your mind, <laughs> that is in your mind only. And they want to get revenge. They want to make your life a living hell. And oftentimes they're doing this, hoping that you will actually go back to them. <laughs> That's interesting. 
but all they're doing in actuality is pushing you that much further away from them. And then, you know, that's their craziness and they can't, you know, they're not in their logic, but yes, that's a great movie, you know, as far as depicting that stalker stuff that I tell you guys about that they are fully capable of um, going into at times. All right, the next movie on my list is the movie Enough. And um, Jennifer Lopez starred in that. It came out May 21st, 2002. Um, and this is good for domestic violence, okay? I like this one as far as a good example of a narcissistic spouse. And a lot of times domestic violence comes along with a narcissistic spouse. So I really like this video. It depicts the love bomb phase as this well-to-do um, businessman meets this struggling waitress and, you know, um, lures her into a relationship, love bombing her. And she ends up being, you know, this uh, middle-class wife in a nice picket fence in the suburbs somewhere and then boom the mass drops you know they have a child together and boom you know he starts cheating on her because you know narcissists they get bored and the primary source you know is never going to be enough for them and she was just there to fill a void to have his child cook his food and clean you know but she was a lot stronger emotionally than he thought because, you know, she she wasn't just going to be happy. He thought, you know what, I pay all the bills. I provide a nice home to you. So what if I want to cheat on you? Deal with it. This is the price you pay. He literally told her this is the price you pay for the comfortable life that you have pay your price basically and narcissists they have this entitlement and particularly the ones that do have finances all narcissists aren't broke busted and disgusted they come from all types of um, walks of life all races and all financial um, statuses and yes everything that they have at their disposal will be used as a tool he was able to lure her in you know she's not gonna have to struggle she's gonna have a good life but bam you're going to have to pay a price for that. I'm going to abuse you at times and I'm going to cheat on you, which is also abusive. All right. So um, he gaslighted her in this movie into thinking that, you know, for everything that he gave her, what is this, you know, the price that she pays isn't really so great in his eyes. Okay. You have to deal with me I'm going to go see Marcy. Now, eventually, you know, because she stayed around with him, he just got super bold. He was like, look, how about I just tell you I'm going to go see Marcy and we just leave it at that. I don't have to hide it. You don't have to feel this. And, you know, everybody's happy. I'm going to go see Marcy. And that really messed her head up. But eventually, you know, she makes a run for it with her daughter and he goes into a narc rage like how dare you try to leave out of my grasp i own you i made you you're not going anywhere with my child or yourself so she ends up actually killing him in the end and um she gets away with it as it's ruled out as self-defense okay so you know it went in her favor she played all her cards right and she you know did not go down for murder so um the last movie that i want to talk about here because i'm i'm wondering there was another one on the list i don't know if i really want to add it to the list because eh. no i'm not going to add it and that was the devil wears prada i'm not going to add that one to the list it's just too disney to me so I purposely skipped on that, skipped that one. I did research it and I'm not going to really talk about it any further, but let me just go to the last one. But that one was kind of reserved and I was like, I'll make a last minute decision on if I want to put that in that in here because it was a work possible workplace example of working for a narcissist. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, yeah, you can take something from it, but to me, it's, you know, too Disney, too Disney for me. 
All right. So let's go on to my last example because I definitely wanted to do a psychopathic um, example. I definitely wanted to provide that because you know, um, that's, that was important to me. So I chose, um, my friend Dahmer that came out in 2017. So this is a recent movie. Okay. And it's based off of the life of Jeffrey Dahmer. Okay. Um, who's AKA known as the Milwaukee cannibal, uh, AKA the Milwaukee monster, and, you know, also known as an American serial killer. All right. So let's talk about him. Now, the first thing I'm going to say is there's a lot of information on him. So if you want to research Jeffrey Dahmer yourself, learning more about psychopaths, feel free to do that. If you are an empath, I'm going to disclose to you that, um, you know, it gets very dark with him. It gets extremely dark and I'll just disclose it right now. And if you don't want to, you know, feel a connection to that dark en energy, do not listen to the rest of my video for this part. You know, maybe just skip ahead um, several minutes here and talk about him. But um, I had to stop at a certain point because I just, I'm like, okay, I've gathered enough information because this man has done um, so much torture and harm. Um, he was convicted of murdering 17 men and boys and his life, um, was full of abuse and, um, addiction, um, starting from his childhood, you know, uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, he was born on May 21st, 1960. And I thought that was pretty interesting, um, as that Jennifer Lopez movie, was released on May 21st as well. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. Um, if I, I didn't really want to jump into numerology and I won't, but, you know, but I did, you know, take note of the num the numerical um, commonality there. All right. So, um, yeah, he was born May 21st, 1960. Um to a dysfunctional um, household, his mother and father, um, they did not get along and eventually they ended up divorcing, which further um, uh, traumatized him emotionally. Uh, where, where can we start here? Because it was just so much. It's like, where do you start? Um, he's been diagnosed with um, BPD, which is borderline personality disorder. Disorder, um, schizophrenia, and even with all of that, though he was found um, legally sane at his trial. Okay, they found him to be legally sane at his trial. Um, boy, um, from a young age, he had this thing with, um, animals and killing them and dissecting them, peeling their skin. His father, uh, went to school to be a chemist and he actually, um, taught Jeffrey how to, um, preserve the am animal's bones. And he later used that information, um, to preserve human bones and hence the Milwaukee cannibal, the Milwaukee monster, um, he found out that he, in uh, puberty, that he was homosexual, and that's why all of his victims are men and boys, all right? Um, he would lure them in because he was attracted to them, but he would do heinous things to them, you know, once he gained their trust or got them behind closed doors, and usually he drugged them in some shape, form, or fashion, you know, you hear the date rate pills and stuff like that. He would utilize things like that and basically rape, murder, um, dismember, and then try to permanently preserve the, the body parts of them. He would have sex with the corpse. Um, he was sexually attracted to the corpses and that's called um, narcophilia for those of you who don't know. Another word for that is para as well. Um, um, let me just pause here 
because I did actually find or looked up some more information on um, narcophilia. They did a study on it. Let me just pull that up real quick because I wanted to share that information that I thought was pretty interesting. Hold on, guys. I'm pulling that up. Mm -hmm. I have so many notes. So many notes. And my phone about this and that. All right. So, um, Rosman and Resnick in 1989, they reviewed information from 34 cases of narcophilia describing the individual's motivations for their behaviors because the people are like, what the hell is behind this? Okay. Individuals, these individuals reported the desire to possess a non-resisting and non-rejecting partner in 68%. So they, out of the 34 cases, basically, um, they filled out the surveys and questioned them to find out that 68% had this attraction because they wanted a non-resisting, non-rejecting partner. 21% um, wanted a reunion with their romantic partners. So, you know, they're sleeping with someone that they previously had a romantic relationship with. 15% just had a sexual attraction to corpses, you know, so this means it could have been a stranger, a corpse. Um, 15% had comfort or overcoming feelings of isolation. And 12% were seeking self-esteem by expressing power over a homicidal victim over a homicide victim, excuse me. So those, that's a little, um, you know, glimpse into people who are, um, narco, who have issues with narcophilia and where their mind is. So it's like domination. So I think, I, I just feel like Jeffrey Dahmer, um, felt like he didn't have control over a lot of things in his life. And, um, you know, doing this to corpses, you know, obviously it was empowering to him. And, and since he was outcast, you know, he felt outcast in his own family home. And there are stories about his mom, um, having issues with wanting to breastfeed him. So, you know, even that mother son, um, connection with the primary caretaker, you know, that was thrown off for him. That was thrown off and she was a struggling alcoholic as well. So, you know, a lot of codependency, a lot of, um, addiction, um, abuse in his home and, you know, it affected him severely. Now, um, Jeffrey Dahmer is no longer alive, but yeah, he was convicted and sentenced to 16 life terms. Um, he ended up dying himself in prison from, um, homicide as, um, he was beaten to death and, and suffered severe, um, head trauma. Um, he did a lot. He did a lot to his, um, victims and, you know, um, it was just crazy. He would skin them, um, pour, drill holes in their forehead and pour acids into it. Um, let the person lose conscious and they would wake up. He would pour more acid into it. But yeah, his father said from a young age, like I was saying, um, age four, that he found he was finding a lot of dead animal bones around their family home. And um, he would, Jeffrey would snuggle or smuggle, if you will, um, alcohol into school as early as age 14. And he said it was his medicine. So he, you know, when people are drinking, they're trying to escape. They're trying to escape. And his father, you know, didn't know that, you know, as a chemist, when he was telling his son this stuff that he was actually empowering um, that serial killer inside of him. He was dishonorably discharged from the army, um, where he, several soldiers said that, um, he raped them. 
So, and he, you know, fell back on his alcoholism and, you know, that really, that and along with his mental disorders, of course, kept him from getting anywhere near to trying to even lead a normal life. Um, he did a lot. He did a lot. But um, my friend Dahmer, that is a movie that you can check out. Um, definitely see a narcissist in the most darkest state, if you will. And I definitely wanted to provide an example of that. All right. So um, I'm trying to, I'm going over Dahmer's notes to see if I missed anything. I think I, you know, I did a good general with him. Yeah, he had rape fantasies and like he just, he had a lot going on in his mind, guys. And, and narcissists generally do. And this is why I always say don't put anything past them. And this is why we need to go that no contact and stay no contact. You know, this is why we have to be careful and increase our emotional maturity, guys. All right. So, um, you know, definitely feel free to check these movies out. They are good examples to help you, you know, visually see this thing called narcissistic abuse on in different types of levels. All right. So if you enjoyed this video. I would like any other videos like this, go ahead and hit the like button. If you learned from it, hit the like button. If you want to support the channel, hit the like button, okay? Feel free to subscribe to my channel. Hit that bell so that you are notified when I upload videos. I like to, you know, come up with, you know, fun and different topics. You know, I like to get creative on my channel and, you know, not be typically like all the rest, you know? So with that being said, guys, um, take what you can to help you in your journey in life. Um, if you need help healing from narcissistic abuse, a toxic relationship, setting goals in your life, um, you know, pulling yourself even out of a depression, a funk, getting recentered and balanced, I do offer coaching, guys. You can go to my website, LakiaCrawford.com and, and schedule a session. I do have a texting package as well now. Because, you know, um, that could be helpful to someone in the healing process to be able to have tech support. So I have added that as an option, along with, of course, already in place, the voice calls, the FaceTime, the Skype and email coaching. All right. So go through it and see which package would best help you. I have the support group on Facebook. Um, inbox me. Let me know that you are a survivor. And that's at uh, Lakia Reflection and Progression Crawford. Those links will be below the video. All right, I'm going to upload this video and um, give me time to go back and um, add all these movies and perhaps a link to help you find further information about the movies if you want to be able to watch it or find it yourself, okay? And with that being said, thank you guys for listening. And um, until next time, please take care.